Growing up in the early 2000s, I was obsessed with Lego. When I wasn't spending my time in my room, surrounded by a sea of scattered bricks, I was rereading Lego magazines, looking at the sets that I didn't own, and memorizing how many pieces each one had. Yeah, I was that kid. A Lego maniac, if you will. I was such a fan of the little bricks that Lego later immortalized me as this Lego Max figure. Neat, right? Anyways, it was the only toy I ever really cared about when I was younger, and it was definitely an important part of my childhood. Now enough about me, let's talk about Lego for a moment, and the black sheep of the Lego world, Galador. At the time, Lego was not the $6 billion company it is today, and it relied more heavily on creating its own themes rather than licensing ones. This led to a lot of strange experimentation, and LEGO even branched out into the realm of action figure related sets, like in the case of Bionicle, which turned out to be a commercial success. The same cannot be said for Galador, however, which is also an action figure based toy line. Released in 2002, these chunky figures were barely even compatible with LEGO sets, and had extremely simple builds, only allowing kids to swap around a few parts. Also, since it was the early 2000s and computer games and other related technologies were becoming more and more popular, LEGO tried to incorporate some of this into their new figures as well. I get what LEGO is going for with these, but even as an adult, these smart toys look a little too confusing and complicated, and I'm not sure I would have enjoyed playing with these that much as a kid. Inflict viruses. I caught amphibid allergies. Well, at least this kid seems to be enjoying himself, even if he doesn't seem to know what the hell he's actually doing. I do remember Galador being advertised in the Lego magazines, and I even had some of the McDonald's toys, but I still always thought they looked so strange and out of place. It was like some other rival toy company accidentally printed their products in the wrong magazine or something. Well guess what, of all LEGO's properties, this abomination of a toy also got its own TV show for some reason. And it's as early 2000s as one would expect. So LEGO! Get it? Let's go, LEGO. Anyways, on to Galador, Defenders of the Outer Dimension. The first scene of the show features some random unnamed guy, whom I'm just going to call Walton Goggles, running away from some poor special effects and carrying some egg-shaped MacGuffin. Then a Darth Vader knockoff materializes out of a swarm of bats, goofily scooting after him, trapping Walton at the edge of a cliff. Walton somehow loses his balance, giving Vader the chance to use his force powers to reclaim the egg thingy. Now's a good time to address two things that this show does that really irks me. Firstly, it randomly slows down or speeds up shots for, like, no reason. Secondly, the editing in even the simplest of dialogue scenes is cut like an action movie, cutting back and forth between, like, eight different shots, which is extremely disorienting. I have no explanation as to why they decided to do this, other than the director being like, We spent the time getting all these shots, we better use every single one. Brace yourself, because this ugly editing style is extremely prevalent in this show, so have your barf bags at the ready. Anyways, Walton Goggles uses some Robot X Machina to transport the egg away from the clutches of Vader. Poor Walton is hurled into a green screen and presumably dies. Or does he? Turns out it could possibly just be a nightmare that our main character is having. Or is it? I don't know. Dun dun dun? At this point, the show's intro starts playing, but it's honestly pretty forgettable, so I'm not going to waste any time playing it. Instead, I'll just take a moment to introduce you guys to the show's amazing two protagonists. First, we have Nick Bluetooth. And yes, his last name is Bluetooth. Technology plays an important role in this show, and I guess the writers decided to name their main character after Bluetooth technology. Of course, this is an utterly ridiculous name for a character. If this show were to be made today, they probably would have named him Nick's Smartphone, or Nick Virtual Reality, or Nick Fortnite. If you guys can come up with any other funny Nick names for old Nick here, leave them in the comments. Our second main character is Allegra, who is named after the allergy relief medicine, 
because allergies were also big at the time. I'm not sure if this is some kind of subtle product placement forced in by some corporate overlord or something, but it's another terrible name regardless. In the next scene, our two heroes are stuck in school, learning about Darwinism and evolution, which conveniently is what the show is all about. Just as the bell rings, Nick the Prick feels the need to interject with his own theories on evolution, and Mrs. Teacher makes everyone stick around to listen to his cringeworthy speech. Alright Nick, are you saying that the textbook is wrong? Saying it's not completely right. Not again. I mean, how do we know some other civilization didn't exist before us? Before the Homo sapiens. Something more advanced than we are today. Because it's not in the book, stick brain. Stick brain? Never heard that insult before, but I'm gonna have to start using it from now on. They could have built, like, huge cities and teletransporters millions of years ago, and then they could have been wiped out by, like, the Ice Age or a meteor or something. If you make me late for practice again, Bluetooth, you're gonna be wiped out by my meteor. You're gonna be wiped out by my meteor. Um, who wrote this? This just sounds, uh, mmm. And you wonder why I'm your only friend. Nick. Scientists have carbon dated the bones of first man to 100,000 BC. It's a fact. But they've only carbon dated the things they found. Duh. What else are they going to do it on? <laughs> Miss Browning, I would think as an educator, you of all people would want to open our minds to the possibilities outside of us become so blindly accepted by the short sighted people who write these books. God, this is so awkward. The cringe is practically radiating off my computer screen right now. I mean, how is that evolutionary? Well, class dismissed. Except for Mr. Bluetooth. Way to go, Bluetooth. Well, Nick ends up in detention for his little stunt, but he still finds time to meet up with Allegra after school and continue to prattle on about his ancient aliens obsession. Why is it so hard to believe that there was another civilization before ours that no one knows about? Maybe even a different species? <coughs> How can you accept whatever you're told without checking out the other options? So Allegra explains something about how Nick always gets weird dreams around his birthday, but the show doesn't really dwell on this for very long because Nick is now focused on trying to perform some mountain bike stunt, because bike stunts were a staple of any show in the early 2000s. Nick, last year, you were almost at one with a mouthful of dirt. But I broke my record. Sure, fine. But maybe it's time you put this annual event to bed. I mean... Negativity. It only serves to... Oh! Don't... Do that. Okay. You know I hate when you do that. Okay. So Sneezy apparently doesn't like it when Nick makes weird foley noises with his hands. Oh. We're then graced with a segment that requires 85 million cuts and an excessive amount of slow-mo black and white bike footage just to show that Nick is an idiot when it comes to high-speed mountain biking. That sequence literally serves no purpose in the overall plot whatsoever. Oh, so close, it's so... Done? Moving on? The next scene involves Nick having a conversation with his grandpa, in which they discuss Nick's outbursts at school, as well as Nick's missing dad, who might be Walton Goggles. I don't know if they ever really explain this further. They definitely don't explain it in this episode. What's up with this kid and smirking? Like, half of these scenes end with him smirking creepily like Anakin Skywalker. Are we sure he's not a Sith Lord or something? Nick falls asleep and has another fever dream, though this time it includes a frogman, a robot, and whatever this guy's supposed to be. And of course, some hilariously bad special effects. Nick wakes up all sweaty and gross again and finds a weird floating computer thing in his bedroom. He decides to bring it to Allegra, who's practicing her martial arts skills in her backyard because one of her biggest character traits is that she knows kung fu. Check this out. Sweet, new video game? It's not a video game. I had this dream last night. Nothing new about that. I know, 
But they've been getting weirder, more intense, more real. Uh huh. So how does it work? It was floating above my bed last night. Floating? Floating. No. Yes. Check this out. All those numbers and signs. It's it's like something from the future. Right, from the future. I swear, Allegra's dialogue is just so meme-worthy. I love it. From the future. So Allegra uses her genius-level intellect and science savvy to determine that the symbols on Nick's no video game? are actually coordinates because all middle school kids in the 90s and 2000s were either computer hackers or science whizzes who could practically make gadgets and technology bend to their will. The coordinates lead the two pals to a random park, which Nick is not too enthused about. You didn't read it right. Yes, I did! These are the coordinates! But there's nothing here! Like, two seconds after his mini meltdown, a sewer just magically opens up as they walk past it. Whoa. This. It's gonna be great. The two adventurers decide to drop down into the underground to see if the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are actually real. After wading through human feces and discarded needles, Bluetooth and Allegra stumble across a strange egg-shaped spaceship just chilling below the city. The egg ship magically opens itself up to them just like the sewer did, which means it must be perfectly harmless, right? You're going in there? You're not. Nick, be careful, please. Allegra tries to warn Nick that they should just let it be, but Nick, of course, is more inclined to take the Prometheus approach to interacting with foreign objects, and therefore proceeds to touch everything inside the ship. You touched something, didn't you? The ship's flight capabilities are activated after Nick places his little Game Boy onto the ship's console, and as the ship begins its cheesy teleportation sequence, the Galador gods gift us with another amazing scene reminiscent of the space jumping scene from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Seriously, you can practically pause this scene at any moment and you'll get a perfectly meme-worthy facial expression that would make even your sweet old granny chuckle. <laughs> After a fun little trip through the space-time continuum, our plucky heroes find themselves in the mysterious dimension of Galador. The two anxiously evacuate the ship in a hurry, not checking to see if Galador actually has breathable air, and therefore quickly suffocate due to the lack of oxygen. The end. If only. They realize they aren't in Kansas anymore, and Nick pieces together that this is the bizarre place he's been visiting during his night sweats. Ow! This isn't a dream, Nick. Once the two finally stop bickering, they overhear a robot complaining about how someone landed an egg ship on top of him. So they head over to lend him a hand. Or in this case, a leg. So this guy's name is Jens, and he's basically C-3PO, only with the added power of plot exposition and the useless ability to change the length of his hair at will. Back up a sec. Where on earth are we? Here. Where is here? Here? That's a stupid question. Here is here. Look, an hour ago, we're in your bedroom. Now, we're... <laughs> I mean, it's... And it's... Use your words. You know, this kind of thing doesn't just happen to me, so... It was quiet here until she showed up. Damn, Yens has zero chill. Let me check real quick, does, uh, does Allegra help with burns too? Since they're stuck on this new world, Nick and Allegra spend the night sleeping on a foam rock. But their cuddle session is interrupted by a blue hologram lady who explains to Nick that he must find a key and follow his heart if he wants to stop Gorm. Now you might be thinking, what's a Gorm? But thankfully, as if on cue, he decides to show up and introduce himself to the heroes, this time appearing as a giant floating head. While the Galador animators work furiously to bring us these stunning visuals, Allegra finds herself tangled up in a pile of conveniently placed tubes. In an attempt to save the audience from Allegra's horrific screams, 
Nick discovers he has the power to turn his arm into a spring thing, and he's able to save her just in the nick of time from the CGI monstrosity. These effects truly are a magnificent treat. Jens explains that Nick has just learned how to glinch, which basically means he can steal the limbs of creatures in his immediate vicinity. Practical, right? Like if I could have one superpower, I'd definitely want to be able to do this. The episode ends rather abruptly with Nick accepting his duty as a chosen one who will bring balance to the force and defeat the evil Gorm with his freakish arm thief abilities. And thus, the three companions rocket away to start their absurd adventure in this bizarre new world. We've got to get out of here to get Euripides. Laura's still out there. Nick, this is all too weird. You're not a warrior, you're Nick. My best friend. Look, I don't know what I got us into, but I'm glad you're here with me. All in all, this show is pretty meh. It's honestly no wonder that this show completely flopped with its weird character designs and equally ugly toy line. The story is a very generic, cookie-cutter tale about a kid whisked away to a new world, only to discover that he's a convenient plot device with the power to save the world. It's been done a thousand times before, and probably a thousand times better in other shows and media. It's just such a weird show with questionable acting and special effects. The characters themselves aren't really that likable either. Nick's kind of a smarmy, egotistical asshole, and Allegra seems kind of overprotective, whiny, and even wimpy at times. Even though the story's bad, the characters are bad, and basically everything about this show is bad, part of me did enjoy watching this, if only to finally see what it was all about after seeing the cryptic commercials and the odd out-of-place ads for it in my LEGO magazines all those years ago. There's always something charming and nostalgic about early 2000s live action shows, no matter how cheesy they are. So at least there's a little enjoyment to be had with this show, despite its mediocrity. Well, that's all the time we have for today's episode of Saturdays. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at Galador. Something, something outer dimension. Eh, who cares? Feel free to share your thoughts on this show if you do have them, and be sure to subscribe for more overly critical looks at kids' cartoons. I've been your host, Max, and thanks for letting me be a part of your weekend. Not really sure why, but I have the sudden urge to bust out my Bluetooth speaker and listen to some banging tunes, so I'll see you guys next time.